So yeah, on my quest to, to, I guess, to find, almost to like educate and, and initiate myself, I, I was very kind of do it myself for a long time. I was studying, reading a lot of books, you know, very, very intellectually. And, um, and I guess it didn't really start to happen very experientially until I entered in this relationship. And, um, and I guess in this, I realized before that, I used to have maybe a very naive kind of uh, perspective of my father. I saw him as a really nice, gentle, loving, kind guy. But as I started to learn what it took to really be present with a woman in all of her seasons in a relationship, I started to realize how my father was uh, maybe very absent in his relationship and absent as a father in my life. And so I, yeah, I, I guess that, that, sort of stoked this this fire in me going like oh like where where are the fathers or where are the elders like like feeling yeah i guess maybe really lonely and lost that there was there wasn't the that i that kind of you know, having to figure it out on my own rather than you know as i learned about what what we used to have in more tribal settings where it was very understood that it was such an important thing for the elders or even you know the, the, the uncles and the grandfathers to really initiate a man into their adulthood. And, um, and I guess starting to see how many men of my father's age are still maybe emotionally adolescent in some ways. And, um, and I guess, you know, yeah, so I was kind of being, I came on this quest to go like, oh, like where is that, that setting for, for initiation or for, you know, just to help me and, you know, other men learn what it what it means to be a man how to how to actually have the consistency in a relationship i know this pattern in myself many times of of you know when a relationship got a bit tough being like oh this is not the right relationship like and try the next one and after a while i go in the same pattern over and over i go oh no there's something to actually persisting and being able to you know keep an open heart even when it's painful and challenging and um so then in that summit or that, in that group circle that tristan organized i was inspired to maybe start documenting my personal quest and and that there you know maybe other men would benefit it so i'm kind of exploring you know can is will this be like a, a call out to other men to maybe shake them a little bit and 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 invite them to take their personal growth or their inner work more seriously um, and also maybe just a bit of uh, an information of what is available i i guess i i question whether you know, maybe in the absence of strong father figures is the the more they maybe the brotherly camaraderie that happens in a men's circle can take that space or take place of that and hold and also i mean, I guess often there's very, there's you know large age difference in many men's groups so maybe in that setting there can be that feeling of that that initiation or being witnessed into our adulthood so that's my journey uh where we're at right now so i said there's you know there's we're still looking at different directions we can go with this project. Um, so mostly we're just, you know, we'll, today we'll probably ask you a very broad range of questions. And as we are sort of informing ourselves from interviewing different people, we will start to form a, a clearer or more focused uh, idea of what this documentary will, will address. Because of course we can't cover all the bases. Well, I think you're describing something that is um many men at all ages are experiencing these days. Mm. Uh, I mean, I deal with young men, I deal with men my age. More, the average age of the men that we've had through our groups is probably about 45. Mm -hmm. I'd like to get that age group down a little bit because mm -hmm. I think the younger men are, are probably uh, a little more confused and searching than, than some of the older guys. Mm -hmm. But um, I think a lot of it stems from many, many young men and women, but many young men being raised without fathers around, without them present, without good male role models. Mm -hmm. And that, a lot of that stuff they got for thousands of years from having relationships with their fathers, with other men, with the community. Those things don't, don't exist. I think, I find very few men that have one or two good male friends in their life. Mm -hmm. Some have none. And as social creatures and as men, as human beings, we need certain things. You know, we need acceptance, we need understanding, we need love, we need uh, all these things that we crave. And I, I maintain that throughout history, most of that emotional stuff that we've gotten and that women have gotten, they've gotten from, men have gotten from men and women have gotten from women. The majority of it. 
And I know that when, as I grew up until I was 40, uh, I was seeking a lot of that from the women because I wasn't getting it from the men. I mean, I had, a, I had a very good upbringing, I think, probably one of the best. My dad was absent in the fact that he was a workaholic, so he didn't do anything with me. He didn't uh, come to any of my stuff as I was growing up. I played hockey, played baseball. I was, you know, music and all that kind of stuff. My mother was the one that, that raised me. And so I was very, very close to my mother. My dad was always there. He was always, when I say he was there, he was home every night. He was a good man, a good hard worker. But he didn't, uh, my experience of him, he never told me he loved me. He never did stuff with me and whatnot. And I didn't really resent it. My mom sort of filled the gaps. So as I grew up to be an adult, it was a lot more natural for me to seek those things from women. As a teenager and as a young male in my 20s and 30s, that's where I'd go and seek it. And they were more than willing to give what they could, but they've never been a man. They don't know how we feel. We're different. And part of the problem I see today is that we're all, men are wondering, well, why doesn't she think like me? Why doesn't she feel like me? And vice versa. I mean, it's a two-way two street, right? Well, we're different creatures. We have different feelings, emotions, and thoughts about different things. We react differently to different things. So I have learned, I didn't start learning this till I was 40, in my 40s, that I can almost naturally get that stuff from the men in my life. So I'm blessed with the fact that I've got, honestly, I've got hundreds of good men in my life. Didn't have that until I was into my 40s. Mm -hmm. So all of those things that I need, I get from the abundance of men in my life. I talk to men every day. Not just through business, but you know, socially and on the phone and deal with stuff. And when I come home to Lucia, my cup is full. Mm -hmm. I used to come home with it half empty if I was lucky or sometimes bone dry. Mm -hmm. So I'd be coming home looking to her. And I was married twice before. With Lucy and I have been together 29 years now, but I was married twice before. So I always came into that environment, as I would say, as a needy little boy. I mean, I can honestly look you in the eye and say that. I was a needy little boy through most of my life. Mm -hmm. Not anymore. So because I don't need her for all of those things that we need, my cup's full. I come home and I can be there for her. I can be there to listen to her and to be there for her no matter what her day's been like and spend time with her and take whatever it is she needs to give me, the good, the bad, the ugly, whatever it is, without taking it personally, without reacting. Uh, and also as a result, she gives, she gives me more in many, many ways than I think any woman ever has in my life. Well, that's pretty good. I mean, is it all bliss and wonderful all the time? No. I mean, sometimes she thinks I'm a, I'm an idiot. I'm a jerk. She gets angry with me. But when she does, I don't. I don't have to react. I don't have to defend myself. Mm. My cup's full. Mm. Does that make sense? Definitely. It's. It's. I mean, I didn't think it was possible. If you, if I'd have sat here thirty years ago, totally different story. Totally different story. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what you're saying is is really relevant actually to my my personal situation right now and i guess i um, and i don't think you're alone there by any stroke of the imagination yeah and i think what happens is is often the the relationship with other men gets not not prioritized enough and i and i kind of going like you know when there's trouble in the relationship i go oh my god i need to put more attention more time into the relationship with the woman and i actually neglect the relationships with the men but therefore my cup is not being filled in that way you described and so that the time that i'm spending with her is not maybe satisfying or filling her cup in that way you describe, which then, I mean, yeah, sure, we're spending more time together, but it seems like it's more time in, in tension or in difficulty, which seems to start to damage the relationship. And I guess, like, like you described, many ways for a long time, I wasn't, I wasn't really interested in hanging out with a lot of guys because most of the guys that I met were, didn't seem to have an emotional availability or a, a, a depth that I was seeking. And I, and I quickly lost interest in more like superficial conversation topics. And so when I wasn't able to find men available to that, I just started to kind of isolate from that or find that with, with women. 
And um, so that's what was really refreshing to see when I started, when I kind of opened the door to many different men's circles, you know, and even last night, you know, to see men that I might normally stereotype as like, oh, those guys like working on cars, those are the guys that are just going to be talking about cars and hockey and stuff that I'm not interested in. But to see you guys, you know, really talking about deep subjects and, and being, yeah, being, you know, emotionally available to each other, it was really, yeah, really refreshing. And um, well... I can relate to that because until I started seeking answers, which you're doing now, mm-hmm. how old are you? 30. 32. 32. See, I didn't really start looking for that until I was 41. Mm. So you got a 10 year head start on me. But up until that time, I held myself separate from other men. I mean, I had a few buddies. Sure. Mm-hmm. I mean, I was a firefighter. I've done construction. I've done all kinds of things. I've worked with men. I've been around them. But I always felt that I was different. Mm. And a lot of them I didn't trust. I didn't have a very high level of trust for men, for most men. There's a couple that I would trust. But for the most part, I'm not like those guys. They're not like me. And so uh, it kept me apart. So when I started on this quest and when I went to um, this men's weekend I did years ago, I really started to say, well, I'm just like those guys. Mm. I mean, yeah, we're all different, but... I found my place amongst men. It's kind of the way I look at it. And up until that point, I would say I clearly had more women friends than men friends. Probably two to one, maybe three to one. I changed that the day I came back. Honestly, I got Lucy and I had been together a couple of years at that time. This is back 26 years ago, 27 years ago. And all those other women friends I had, I got rid of them. Like immediately, and I did it very nicely. I did it with honorably. I mean, they were good women, but I told them, I said, you know, I don't need you in my life anymore. Thinking they just, what's, what's wrong? What are you? You did nothing wrong. And from that moment forward, I really shifted, getting my most of those needs met from the men in my life. And it was, boy, I tell you, that first few years was transformative. And then I could be there 110% for Lucia. And our relationship started to change. It was a little bit of a struggle initially because it had gotten over the few years we'd been together. It got a little dicey, like, oh, is this going to work out? I didn't, I didn't want to go through another relationship because I knew she was a good woman, and she is. She's amazing. But I was always coming with my cuff, cup half empty or uh, I was coming being needy. So now I say, well, I've got hundreds of men in my life that give me what I need, and I've got one woman in my life that gives me what I want. I don't know if that sounds a little corny or not, but um, it, it's the difference is incredible. And I'm so much more comfortable for who I am. Uh, and we have our issues, but we get through them. Because she's not dealing with a little boy anymore. And I, I don't get it. We haven't had an argument. I don't think we've had an argument. I mean, she's been pissed at me a number of times, but I don't engage in that. Why would I? The minute I have a fight with a woman, it's, I'm treating her like a man. I don't want to do that. She's not. She's amazing. So I wouldn't go down that road. I don't need to. I can be right without convincing her I'm right. You know, she doesn't need to think like I think or feel, see things the way I see them, or vice versa. I can be open to her point of view and how she is and what she thinks. She, it's very, very different. So I don't spend a lot of time anymore worrying about the relationship. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm there. I don't run away. Uh, I don't know how else to say it. So it's, we just, gr- it's great. Yeah. I mean, I know that is something I'm struggling with that that's, yeah, that getting argumentative, getting defensive. Um, and funny, the funny thing is, I don't do that very often with men in my life, yeah. but I get into that all the time with my woman. And for what I hear you saying is that it kind of needs to be the other way around. And I noticed that last night in your dynamic, there was, there was a comfortable, like challenging or teasing or, you know, a bit of a provocative rapport between you and some of the guys you could well, see Bob were very comfortable said, with. We did our weekend together 26 years ago. I mean, he's one of my mm-hmm. best buds. I can, we can tell each other exactly what we think. We don't just, we don't agree all the time. Most of the time we do, but if we don't, we can 
say how we feel and it doesn't hurt. You yell at a woman or call her a name and that's like sticking a knife in her. And a lot of men do it. They never forget it. You call a man a, you know, uh, an asshole or whatever, and it's almost like a badge, badge of honor. But it, it, even if it isn't, it's gone in a few minutes. The, the, most men won't hold that against another man. Yeah, women are, they're meant to be respected and honored and appreciated and, and uh, accepted. It's not enough of that going on. And in, in both ways, we need to learn to, I, I maintain we need to, as men and women, we need to learn to uh, respect, honor, trust, appreciate, embrace the differences between us, because we're different. And there's not enough of that going on. Accept it. We're, we're so different. We're being told now a lot in, in what we see in the media and movies and everything else that oh, we're the same. We should think that... Equality. Well, equal pay for equal work. I can totally support that, and that hasn't been happening enough. But we're not. I don't. I don't think we're equal, because I think some people when they think it's equal, they they think we're the same. Well, we're not the same. Opposites attract. Physically and in nature, opposites attract. So, let's appreciate the difference. Understand and accept it. Doesn't happen. I, I mean, I I was guilty of it. As guilty as anybody in the past. Yeah, I would say, in my experience, it's actually kind of rare to meet people who have been in relationships over 20 years. And, yeah. And I, I'm curious, actually, before you started connecting more with men, like, what was your longest period of relationship? I was married twice before. First marriage was about 10 years. Two, two amazing children from that marriage. Mm -hmm. And we got divorced and then I remarried uh, about a year or so later for six years, five, six years. We didn't have any children by that marriage. And then about a year after that ended, Lucy and I got together. And we've been together now 29 years this year. Uh -huh. Yeah. So would you say in, in your personal experience and from what you've witnessed in other men, yeah. that's that having that consistency in that openly relating and that camaraderie with men um, is makes a substantial difference in a man's ability Huge. to to persist or like sustain a healthy relationship with a woman I, I think it's probably the biggest piece I have a saying that the degree to which we are being the man the world needs and the man that women need is directly proportional to the quality and quantity of good men we have in our life. Mm -hmm. And I say that from my own personal experience, but I also say it from dealing with men and working with men and being around men. The more men that have good quality men in their life on a regular basis, typically the better the relationships are, the more successful they are, and the better quality men they are. If we're left to our own devices without good men, I mean, our prisons are full of people like that. Uh, divorce courts are full of people like that. Um, it, 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 it wasn't meant to be that way. And there's more and more of that now than there probably, I think, probably has been in history. I mean, I mean there's always been bad men out there, and there always will be. The world's not a perfect place. Never will be. But the more good, honorable men that we have associating with each other, the better place we got. You are who you hang around with. I mean, you've heard that expression before. You know, you take a look at your five or ten closest friends and it'll give you a pretty good indication of really who you are and what, what kind of man you are. Well, let's try and make that as good as we can. And I... It's not looking very good in a lot of societies, and a, a lot of cultures, a lot of places these days. Yeah. What would you say are maybe some of the, the long-term costs or consequences for, for men who just, for whatever reason, avoid opening up or relating to other men? Maybe they have 
feel don't not like like you mentioned they don't trust or feel safety or they're maybe stuck in a constant kind of competitiveness or comparing and and therefore they never sort of shed that that armor and and can sort of openly express themselves well you know we we do a few things i think when that happens is we bottle those emotions up and those feelings uh, and you get in a situation where eventually the cork's going to blow and something's going to happen. And if you don't have any men in your life that you can deal with those feelings and emotions on a regular, semi-regular basis, at some point it's going to it's going to go loose. And if if you're with a woman, it may come off at the wrong time in the wrong way, and somebody might get hurt emotionally or physically. I'll tell you a little story. I, a few years ago, I was driving along. I was listening to uh, CKNW, and they were interviewing. Uh, there had just been one of the big sh- shootings down in the U.S., as they've had many of them, where these, some young fellows got out and massacred or killed a lot of people, and they were doing this talk show on it. And they had some guy on who was a psychologist. I think he might have been from SFU or UBC or something, and he was talking about this. And a caller called in, and this caller said... Uh, there's a common denominator that nobody wants to talk about that he believed was the root cause of this. And it went kind of silent. And this lady who was conducting, I don't know, it was Simi Sarah, it might have been, it was one of them. I said, no, what is it? And he said, it's divorce. And it kind of went silent again for a minute. And um, he said, yeah, he said, that's the root cause of all of these things is divorce, absence of fathers, these young people being raised without them. And, this guy that was on the, the so-called expert said, well, that hasn't been my experience. He kind of blew him off, and they hung up on the guy. When I was driving, I'm thinking, I wonder. So what did I do? I went home. I spent some time over a couple of evenings, and I did some research online. And there's no difficulty in finding a long, long list of these predominantly men, almost 90%, mostly younger men in their, I would say, under 30 predominantly, and there was a few exceptions. but from my, And sometimes it was hard to dig out the information to see, because I was trying to search for these guys. Where they, did they come from broken homes? Were they from divorce? Were they, whatever. Well, I think of the, and I searched 20, maybe 30 of them over the course of the last 30, 40 years. And I think there was only two, maybe three, where these young men had come from homes that were not broken, that were, and these men I felt, from them, further research had psychological issues. But almost exclusively, those young men that had done those things came from divorced homes, raised by their mothers, a lot of them, or there was a few that had very abusive fathers. I mean, sad cases. So what does that tell me? I think there's a connection there. Now, does that mean that if you come from a divorced home, you're going to go out and shoot somebody? No, it doesn't mean that at all. And then I started compiling other research around, um, and there's lots of it out there, the, uh, the people in our prison systems, the, uh, the uh, addictions, the, all of the stuff that we're trying to deal with in our society, the vast majority of those can be, the, the incidents, the percentage of those can be traced back to just what I said. Fathers, absent, young men being raised uh, without their fathers in their lives on a regular basis or without good male role models in their life. Mm. Stats are high. It's not exclusive, but it's a scary number. Um, do you think that uh, is connected to how maybe how men relate with to grief or don't relate to grief? It, I think it probably, I hadn't thought about that specific question. It probably has some bearing around it. Sure. What 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 I mean, loss of a parent or loss of. Well, I just mean grief in in general with whatever disappointments, frustrations, breakups. Like just in general, I, I guess I've am questioning whether a lot of men are not comfortable going through a natural grief process and they uh, avoid it, uh, run away from it, and then as you say, it kind of sure, bottles up and and blows out in maybe some some destructive way and and i'm wondering you know maybe what your personal journey has been learning to deal with grief or if do you find that that um in your gatherings with other men that there 
Yeah, do you have a... Do you guys create a, a space for that or an attentiveness to... Well, absolutely. To... I, I've done many men's weekend workshops where the typically what you do in these is you do an anger exercise where men are allowed to or able to in a very safe environment to release the anger. Most men don't get an opportunity to do that. So when they do, what we find underneath that is often grief. It's hidden under the anger. So if they're able to express and release and deal with that anger, the next thing you want to do after that is look at, now that you peel the onion open, what's under there? Mm -hmm. And in many cases it's grief, and grief and forgiveness are two things that once the anger's been released, men need to deal with those issues as well. And it, for some men, it's almost be, like being reborn. I mean, they have, it, it's an incredible experience for them. And again, if they don't get to do that in a safe environment, they're going to be with their women at some point, likely. I mean, in, in all cases, no, but that's the last place you want them, that I as a man want to deal with it. It'd be devastating. Often is. Devastating for your woman to see you break For your down. relationship, for your woman, for, I mean, they should never have to take that from a man, ever. Do you find that a lot of women almost seem to want to, or maybe, or maybe there's a kind of an unconscious dynamic happening between men who, um, whatever, never got to complete something with their mothers and the natural nurturing in a woman sometimes creates this dynamic where, where a man kind of becomes needy and, and almost like there's a bit of a setup that somehow ends up with, with a woman often comforting and nurturing and kind of mothering uh, her man. And that she naturally ha has an opening to do that, but maybe doesn't, neither the man or the woman realize that that starts to affect the, the respect or the, the attraction of the physical chemistry because it's taking away from the, maybe the more equal sort of, um, you know, lovers, partners relationship and replaying a bit of this mother-son dynamic. I think there's a lot of, I'm going to say, messed up stuff going on between men and women that probably shouldn't in a healthy relationship shouldn't need to happen, but it does. Mm -hmm. And it does, I mean, let me think about this. It does because uh, I don't know. It maybe does because men haven't been able to deal with a lot of those emotions, the anger, grief or whatever that they have. I, in my research, I believe throughout history, men have been doing this kind of work with men. Been around the campfire at night. Men before going into battle used to do this. They'd cleanse themselves. They would deal with all kinds of stuff so that when, then when they go into battle, they're clean. They've dumped all their stuff. And they have a much better chance of surviving in that battle if they've released that stuff. Sometimes they'd do it for a day or two before going into battle. I mean, I'm talking hundreds or maybe thousands of years ago. Well, our battle now isn't like the battle they had back then, but our battle now is going into our careers. I was going to say going into our relationship, but I don't, I don't want that to sound wrong because it, 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 it shouldn't be a battle. But it's, it's stuff that we deal with that if we're not going in clean, if I'm making sense, if, we're, if I'm not going into that relationship clean with all my uh, uh, negative emotions, all my anger, all my frustration, all my grief, if I'm bringing that into the relationship or bringing that into my business environment, mm -hmm. what's my chances of being successful there? I don't think it's very good. Because those things will start popping up in my business or they'll start popping up in my relationship with my woman. And if they start popping out at the wrong time, it's not the place to deal with it. I think the place to deal with that is between you and me as men. Mm -hmm. So that we're clean. So that we're, I don't know if I'm using the right word, but you, you get what I'm saying? We, yeah. we absolutely need to deal with those emotions and those things. I personally, I could be wrong here, and I don't think I am, but 
I don't think it's a woman's job to deal with that for me, and I don't think it's my job to deal with that for her. I don't think it... I don't think we've done that in most societies and cultures for thousands of years. Why would we all of a sudden think it's a good idea to do it now? I mean, yeah, we're in a changing time, we're in a changing culture, we're changing... Lots of things, the world's changing so rapidly. But are we really changing that much as men and women? I don't think so. I don't think we should be. I think the fact that we're trying to change some of that dynamic and trying to change some of the responsibilities, I think it's causing more problems than it's causing good. Divorce rates are up. I mean, you look at, and here's the other thing about divorce rates, it's kind of interesting. What do they say? They run at 50, 60%, maybe. I don't believe those divorce rates account for the thousands and thousands of people that hook up, get together, live together for a while, maybe even have children, never get married and they leave. That doesn't show up in a divorce statistic. Well, how many people do we know? I know lots of them that have been through that. So I maintain if you if the divorce rate is, let's call it a separation rate, I think it's much higher than what our statistics reflect. And the damage caused by those, I think, is higher than we want to acknowledge. Divorce has become, I mean, I kind of said this the other night when we were chatting, divorce has become accepted, acceptable, almost fashionable. Well, how many times have you been married? You know, I, mean, I, mean, I don't know how many times I've heard that question asked of people. Right. How many times have you been married? Well, I've been married, this is my third go, unfortunately. But I didn't learn what I needed to learn until I was 40 years old. If I could have learned it when I was 20, mm-hmm. would I still be together? For, I don't know. I'm not going to turn the... I mean, I don't have regrets. Uh, I've got an amazing relationship and an amazing wife now. And hopefully, I can help other men... Uh, stick handle through what they're going through so that they don't need to go through what I went through twice. I believe I can. I know I've helped men do that. Would you say that there's a, it's a, it's a very small majority of men that are kind of digging into these things, um, seeking out men's circles or that personal therapy? And, and if so, why do you think it's such a small uh, percentage or minority of men that are kind of doing their work? That's a good question. I think based on what we're exposed to in movies, in the media, by Hollywood, by whatever we're exposed to, I think young men that have grown up in that culture just, they don't see how it can possibly be any different. I think fewer and fewer men are, are even think a long, when I say long term, really, a lifetime partner. I think if you ask the average young man, they don't think that's possible. Really? Mm-hmm. You know, well, we'll get together, we'll hook up, maybe we'll have a couple of kids, and if it doesn't work out, we'll go on and find somebody else. You know, it'll be great, we'll work together, and we'll do our best for the kids, and the kids will be okay. Well, I mean, that's bullshit, really. Mm-hmm. But it's what we've been taught, it's what we're being told, it's what it's what's acceptable, and it's what's going on. We see it all the time. You know, I'll tell you finally, I, I got my son, who's 43 years old, he's got two daughters. They're 13 and 16. He's got a great family. And when the first daughter was born 16 years ago, I was there at the hospital, I went there, and showed up, and he brought her out when she was delivered, and I looked him in the eye, and I said to him, I said, I just want you to know you got an 18-year sentence until this little girl is at least 18 years old. You and Brandy are going to be, his wife's name is Brandy, are going to be together, over, except over my dead body. And I said it joking. i got a good relationship with my son, but I meant it. If they have a problem, which they will, if you need me for anything, I'm going to be here to do what I can. I'm not going to interfere with this relationship. But I'm going to be there as his father and a man in his life to see that he gets what he needs so that that little girl has mom and dad together in a good environment until she doesn't need them anymore. And when the second one was born, when Kayla was born, 
I said, I was there, I said, I, you, just so you know, you've added 18 years to your sentence. I pick 18 as a time when, you know, kids get through school, they're adults, they're, they're pretty much self-sufficient and they don't really need mom and dad anymore. And they're 13 and 16, family's doing good. I talk to my son almost every day. Not to just, I'm there for him. But I'm serious, if I get wind that there's something going on that's a problem, I'll be sitting him down and helping him work through that. How many people do that today? How many people go to a wedding and you know you're witnessing this and if and but when the rocket road gets a little rocky, does anybody really help out and try and figure out what needs to get back to where it was when they were standing up there and so madly in love with each other and so blessed and so grateful for each other? What happened? Well, stuff happens. Who helps people get through this sort of stuff? What they're more prone to do is coach them on how to split up the assets, how to manage the kids, how to go for 50-50, 70-30. That's the coaching they get. That's got to stop because it's not benefiting the kids. It makes me think that's, I get that. I get the importance of that. If you know, if the couple can work things out and, and how important it is maybe to have support around to work it out. But um, to stay together just for the kids is not what I'm saying. Yeah, because this is what I'm thinking of and thinking of my parents. They maybe in many ways were so independent or had a very pioneering spirit. They, did, they didn't have much of a community to support them in their relationship, but they stayed together just for the kids. And in many ways, it, it seemed kind of toxic. And that I, I wonder if they're... they're maybe not having the courage to, to get angry and, and work stuff through together and then repressing it. I in fact feel that, that I actually worked out a lot of that stuff by unconsciously just taking it on, getting rebellious, acting out, like feeling their, their unresolved stuff. And I feel like I'm still working through their unresolved stuff. And so I wonder if, if there's, yeah, if there's a, if there's a time for, for, a, an honorable separation with, with I don't know, because like I, I, at what point does staying in a relationship with the kids like just become unhealthy? Well, I would suggest that the children should be the motivation for staying together. Because if you don't have kids and you're not getting along, bugger off. Mm -hmm. But if you've got children, I believe I have a if I have children, I have a responsibility to work it out. Not just to stay together because I got these two little kids, but they need me. They need us to lead by example. For me as a man, my children need me to show them what a good man is and what a good man is in relationship. I need to show my son what he needs to grow up to be. And I don't want to show him that that's grown up to be a man that fights with his mother or fights with his wife. That's not being a good example. And if I've got a daughter, she's likely to grow up looking for a man like me, certainly provided that I'm being a good example. Mm -hmm. So I have a responsibility as a father and as a husband to show those children how they need to be and what they need to expect in the future. Now I'm going to run up against stuff in a relationship that sometimes I don't know what to do. I don't know how to deal with her. I don't know how to be with her. Now I have found myself over the last 26 years, the best way for me to get that, the absolute best way is from other men. And it's there. And sometimes I've got to search a little bit to find the right men, because a lot of men don't have those answers as well. <laughs> but there's gold there when I can find those men that can mentor me and guide me and teach me how to be that man, how to be with my wife, with my woman, so that we're not at odds with each other. We're not fighting like cats and dogs. We're not setting a poor example for our children. It's doable. It's absolutely doable. And I, furthermore, I believe, I think it's doable with almost any man or any woman. 
given that they've spent some time and they've got together and they've had at some point in their life, they've had a good relationship that created these children. I mean, that usually isn't created out of violence and anger, <laughs> unless I missed something. Those children are created out of a part of their relationship that was working. Well, sometimes shit happens and we don't know how to do things. We don't know how to deal with things. And then we look for our partner to help solve that. Well, maybe they can't. Maybe my wife doesn't know how I feel as a man, but God bless her. She'll do what she can to help me with it. She's the mother, the nurturer, the caregiver. That's, that's what they do. But she doesn't know how I feel any more than I know how she feels. So if I'm not getting that, whatever it is, I found over the last 25 years, I, I can generally get it from good men. I can get that understanding. I can get that release. I can get that knowledge so that when I go back to my wife, I'm not looking for it. I'm not needing it. It's, it's handled. And I'm not that little boy, which I was for 40 years, mm -hmm. emotionally. It um, makes me think of... Probably... It's, it's, not, it's not complicated. I mean, we make it complicated. It's actually fairly simple. It takes discipline. Especially when I come home sometimes, if Lucia's had a bad day and she's not feeling well, she's cranky, whether there's something going on. It's easy. If I've had a, not such a good day as well, it's easy for me to react. It's easy to get sucked into a, an argument or a fight. That's the easy road. It's painful. It doesn't solve much. I don't need to do that anymore. I'm sure you've heard the saying, the, what is it, the, the key to a man's masculinity, is it, is hidden under his mother's pillow? I don't know that I've heard that one. Okay, something like Say that. Say that again? A, the key to, uh, a, or maybe a boy's manhood is hidden under his mother's pillow. Or I think maybe also I've heard talk or statistics about how many men like, like often still live with their mothers or have such a, a, a needy kind of, or a, a boy, like a child-mother relationship with their mothers, even though they're, they're adults. And that there's a, I think part of these, the, you know, the tribal rites of passage were a significant like separation of the boy from the mother and a grieving of that and then a re-meeting of more of equals of adults. And I would say I, I started to notice, like, yeah, at 16, I left rebelliously, you know, with a lot of, con I think I've only started to understand this now, I guess, because of my father's absence in engagement with me, yeah. it fell to my mother to kind of be a father and a mother for me. Sure. And, and that, that of course, a creates a lot of tension between her and I. So tons of like fighting and head to head and finally at 16, I just took off. And, but what I started to notice was that I started um, to attract and, and get involved in relationships where I was creating very similar dynamics that I had in arguing with my mother or the conflict with my mother again and again. And about 26, I went, wait a minute, this is becoming a pattern. Like, I realized I need to go open up the interactions with my mother again to kind of heal things, put things to peace so I can actually have a healthy relationship. And I guess I would wonder what maybe what advice you would have or, or how through your experience in, in the men's retreats um, or men's circles that helps them get over that, that unhealthy relationship with mother. Sure, and, I, and, I, I get what you're saying. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe, and this used to happen in tribal cultures, as you said, mm -hmm. it was often in many cultures, it was a ceremony that, that would create this, but uh, I believe a man needs to sever that umbilical cord with his mother. It doesn't mean to say he doesn't love her and that she's not important to him, but that father, that mother-son bond needs to be severed. That piece that has got him tied to her as a little boy. Mm -hmm. And I see men that carry that on their whole life. Mm -hmm. And I see men in relationships that have got a wife and then they got the mother-in-law that the wife and the mother-in-law don't get along because he's tied to both of them. Well, he can only be tied to one of them. Mm -hmm. Successfully and effectively. Now a smart mother, and there are some out there, 
will recognize that. And when the boy grows up and becomes a man, she'll let him go. She'll still love him. It'll still be her baby. It'll still be, that'll, that'll never end. And say, my mother was like that. My mother, I had a good relationship with my mother her whole life, but when I grew up and left home and became a man and got married, my mother didn't try and control me. She didn't try and meddle with what I was doing, and she didn't try and stick her nose in it. She didn't. A lot of women do that. Okay, so, and I think it's up to the man in most cases to somehow, the, the boy when he becomes a man, to, to sever that piece of the connection. Doesn't mean to say he doesn't love his mom. Like that, that, that's, that doesn't need to change. Mm -hmm. But yeah, what you just described—it it absolutely needs to happen. You can't. I don't think a man. There's always exceptions, but we can't be. We can't. We can't have two women that we uh, answer to on all levels. And it's it happens. I see it happen. Just can't doesn't work. Mm -hmm. It probably really tears at the, the man's psyche. Well, it does. And like, you know, to me in a different way, I mean, I had, uh, when the first couple of years Lucina and I were together, I had other women friends. You know, they weren't women I was sleeping with. They were having really affairs with that. But I had other women, female friends that I would seek counsel from sometimes and whatnot. I mean, I got real clear that didn't serve, it didn't serve me and it didn't serve my relationship with Lucia. So I, I mean, it was it was easy. Well, that's like once the light came on, and I realized it was easy for me to do. And since that, since that time, I have not had, I have not had the space or opened the door for another woman to come in and fill any of those gaps. I got one woman. That's all I need. I don't need one. That's it. So. Um... Can you give me any any examples, or just tell me a little bit about how, in men's retreats or in your like weekly gatherings, you help men sort of release that that bond or that that tie to mother. Do we actually do that piece? I mean, or do you say it's just something that happens naturally? when you open up to that connection with men? I hadn't thought about it. Does it ha I don't know that it happens naturally. I'm trying to think about how did it happen for me. I mean, clearly I came to the realization through the work I've done and I got pretty clear on the... the I mean, I've done many different personal development courses. Some masculine-oriented, some co-ed. I've done all kinds of things. Uh, but the very first one I ever did that was all men was 26 years ago. And I'm going to say that was a lot of it was through that experience with men. I figured out who I was as a man. I started to start to figure it out. Anyway, I got moved light years in the matter of two days and two nights. I got pretty clear on that. So, uh, I got to say that that probably had a huge piece to do with the realization that the way, what worked, what didn't work. A lot of what I thought worked before, I started seeing, well, that didn't work very well. You know, I started accepting who I was as a man and, and uh, embracing that where I'd resisted it. You know, that's it. I'm not like that. Yeah, the realization of who I was as a man and just having other good, solid male influences in my life. Um, became less needy, not overnight, but certainly started down the path in a big way. Because I, I think back, it was, it was a big transition. I mean, I had these, <laughs> these women friends. They were good friends, good women, for the most part, pretty. And some of them had been friends of mine for a number of years. I haven't seen them since. I haven't spoke to them since. I hope they're doing well, but... I know I'm doing a lot better. <laughs> Wasn't serving you. And I, it certainly didn't serve Lucia to, in some way, be competing for whatever. I mean, like I say, I wasn't having affairs with women, but emotionally there was ties there, which couldn't have been healthy for the relationship. Absolutely wasn't healthy for the relationship. How could it be? 
Yeah, I noticed that in my myself and I think in other men in my generation, or maybe it's kind of it can be a common thing for some men is is maybe spreading like almost the fear of going too deep, being too vulnerable with one woman, but sort of satisfying the need for connection by spreading it out amongst a few. And yeah, and there's all if the woman that you're friends with her is attractive, you're attracted to her, which usually you are, you wouldn't likely be friends with it. Sometimes you can say, well, it's, yeah. it's just a spiritual thing or it's just an intellectual thing. I mean, in most cases, that's bullshit. Mm -hmm. Let's be honest. So if there's always that underlying unspoken thing going on, it's, it's dangerous. It's not healthy to, certainly if you've got a primary relationship, it's not healthy to that relationship. It can't be. Because I imagine the tendency is when things get tense or difficult in the primary relationship to avoid it and, you know, take the, kind of the easy path to, well, sure. to nurture. With, I've got this other relationship or friendship over here that if I ain't getting it here, I'll get it over there. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's not, it's not necessarily sex. It could be, but it's not necessarily. It could just be that emotional acceptance. Mm -hmm. You know, I believe love to a man boils down to the word acceptance. Mm -hmm. There's other things on the list. I mean, we hear people talk about love. Most people don't even understand what the hell love is. Mm -hmm. But to us as men, I think the, the top of the list, I think, is acceptance. If I'm accepted 100% for who I am and what I am, it doesn't get any better than that. Mm -hmm. Well, if I'm not getting it here, I gotta get it somewhere. And if there's other women in the circle or in the vicinity, it's you know it's generally pretty easy to go plant some seeds and get that in various places. I get all the acceptance that I ever need from all the men in my life. I get a lot of it from Lucia, but if I'm not getting the full meal deal from Lucia at some point because things aren't maybe going well with her, I'm okay. I got lots. It gets back to the full cup. I mean, so I don't think about it. Whereas before, it was always on my mind. Yeah, sweetie, would you please? I mean, I wouldn't say this verbally, but in my mind, I mean, how come you don't accept me? Well, what's going on? I need, I mean, I need, I need you to appreciate me. I need you to accept me. I need you to, to love me. I need you to, I'm not coming from that place right now. Mm -hmm. And because I'm not, I get a lot. You ever ever notice if you want something really badly, sometimes it's hard to get, but when you don't necessarily want or don't care about it, it seems like it's, well, there it is again. I just got some more. I'm having a little light bulb right now in going, hmm, maybe because I'm seeking so much acceptance and approval from my women and, and I'm not, get, you know, aware and getting it in other sources that when it feels like it's threatened or when I feel her change or like and that's what I've noticed you know she can change in a minute one day be so like loving and appreciative and then flip to the other side but I think I get so defensive because I'm almost relying solely on her approval for my self-esteem or well, self-worth I don't believe that women like needy little boys unless they are needy little boys I mean the mother thing that they're attracted to that. But this needy little boy, they get sick of that pretty quick. They'll take little bits of it because they're mothers, mothers, nurturers. If you look back at, let's go back to when you're in high school. Who were the guys that were getting the best, the most, and the hottest chicks? Needy little boys? Not the school I went to. It was the guys who didn't need anything, the guys that were uncontrollable, uh, the guy, sometimes the guys that were the assholes. Well, what does that tell you? So if you can be that type of man and yet be committed to her and be respectful of her and treat her well and listen to her and, and do all the things that she really wants and be that uncontrollable, crazy, wild, maniac committed to her. I don't think she thinks she's going to get any better than that. But if we're 
relying on that approval from her, then we won't let that that wild adventurous spirit out because we'll constantly be concerned that she, whatever she will disapprove yeah, think, or withdraw her acceptance. I think she'll get tired of it fairly quickly. Most of them, when you grow up, and this stuff about be a man. I mean, I I, I don't want to even go down that road. It's just stop being a little boy. And I say that because I spent the first half of my life pretty much being that little boy to one degree or another. I mean, I was fairly successful. I'd done a lot of things, but inside, I was a little boy. And I was needy. It didn't work. It doesn't work in a long in a long term committed relationship. And that, I think that's another reason you talked about. Do people think they can have a 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 year long-term relationship? I mean, I'm 68. I think I've got another 30 years left in me. So Lucia and I, have been, we will probably be together for 60 years. I can't see anything that's going to change that. I mean, anything could happen. But I don't, uh, yeah, anything could happen. But I don't think, I don't think it will. And I, I don't want to stick my head in the sand and ignore the fact that it could because, I, I, and also, my ins here's my insurance policy. All the good men I got in my life that will inspect me and that will make sure that when I screw up, because I screw up once in a while, that I can get back on track, and that I'm not going to take stuff out on her and I'm not going to make her pay for stuff and, you know, I mean, emotionally, whatever. I'm not going to do that because the men I got in my life won't let me do that. I think I'm pretty well insulated from it now anyway after, you know, 20 some odd years of disciplining myself. And it's pretty easy now. It wasn't easy in the beginning. I gotta tell you, it wasn't easy gaining back what I'd given up and the screw ups I'd had. It wasn't that easy. It's been tremendously rewarding though. Um, I remember studying a bit about the maybe the development of the male brain and, and the different phases we go through and it's saying, um, you know, I guess like around like 27, 28, there starts this, what some people call a Saturn return, or there's actually another hormone that's released into the brain that kind of settles more of the personality. Like 24 to 28 is more, or I guess 20 to 28 is more exploring many different directions to form a sense of identity. Now, I wonder if... Um, like perhaps getting involved in serious long-term relationships at such an early age um, can be difficult if, if because women go through that that too, that, that kind of maturing, that changing in the late 20s, but maybe a little bit earlier than men, that if, you know, sometimes I think personalities change so much because often maybe we are taking on our family's ideas of what we should be or a doctor or a lawyer or something. But as we get deeper into ourselves, we go, oh, no, wait, I'm going to go in a completely different direction. And I wonder if this often really puts a lot of strain on relationships if two people get getting together in their early 20s suddenly realize they're they're very different people by the, their late 20s and in some sense i wonder if it's if it's actually very beneficial to to like hold off a bit from like having children at such a young age and and waiting till the you know a little more mature or the identity is settled a bit to really finding that long term kind of relationship Good, good point. I, I think most young people are in such a hurry to find somebody, and they have no idea really what they're looking for. And at an early age, most there are, there's always exceptions, but most people uh, don't really have a clue on really who they are, what's important to them, what their terms are. Uh, speaking from a man's point about who they are as a man. So we go out and, you know, we know what we're attracted to, you know, nice boobs, nice ass, whatever, whatever it is. And that's what we go to, but we don't start, we, we haven't defined ourselves enough as a man to really know who we are as a man, what's really important to us. We need to go through these phases of life. So the short answer is, yeah, most people, they, they rush into it get hooked up for the wrong reason. She makes me feel good. He makes me feel good. This must be it. 
but I don't know what my purpose is in life yet. I don't know where I'm going. I don't have a plan. I don't even know really who I am. And I don't really even know what I'm looking for, but I know I want to feel good. And she does it, so let's hook up. Let's get married. Let's have babies. And then a few months or a few years down the road, it's like, what did I do? Who are you? If they can learn this stuff as they go, let's say they get into that situation, fine. Most people can't because they don't have the support mechanism to do it. They don't have the role models. They don't have... They're watching movies to try... Reality TV, they're watching all this stuff that Hollywood produces that sells. that doesn't work. But it's what we as young men and women grew up thinking, okay... That's what I. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to. I'm going to create that in my life. Well, that that you're seeing probably doesn't work, but it sells. It looks good. It's not reality. Um, so yeah, most people jump in way too quickly. They have no idea what the hell they're doing, where they're going, and there's no support mechanisms in their life. They don't have. If they don't have good men in their life and they got this woman that's going to try and teach them how to be a good man, to me that's a formula for disaster. Now if you get hooked up and he's got a lot of good good men in his life that can help him get through those tough times and coach him and mentor him, he's got a chance. You mentioned um, something about like forming a plan. And um, I know it just brought to mind that my, my woman has, has kind of been sort of prompting me to, to have more clarity in my, my plan in my life, and, you know, in business, finance, personal, like growth goals, that kind of stuff. And, and but then, you know, and in some ways I, I get kind of, oh, you know, it, it unsettles me a bit. But I, I, she points out what I keep getting stuck on is, is I keep thinking I need to go and do it by myself. And you go like, okay, go into my cave, come up with my plan, and then like, okay, this is it, like I got it. But whenever I do that, it seems like the plan isn't very solid. And, um, and so then I'm wondering like, oh, so I'm curious on your perspective, like how wise is it or beneficial is it to, to work on developing the plan with, with your woman or, or more like maybe with other men, developing your plan and having men challenge it? I, w I would say with other men. I mean, it's, I'm not saying a woman can't, do that or it's not capable of. Mm -hmm. But I would suggest that they are probably the exception, not the rule. But I guess I would want to, some women maybe react to be like, what, are you just going to show me the plan? Like, I didn't have any input. Like, yes. er. Personally, I wouldn't even go look there. Right. 30 years ago, I would have. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but sitting here today, I wouldn't. I wouldn't even dream of it. I would find, and if I had to look, and look, I would find a number of good men that I could get to mentor me and coach me and help me long before I would think about finding a good woman. There's tons of good women. Why would I, for me as a man, why would I try and coach a woman on how to do that? To find herself as a woman and to define who she is or what she is. I wouldn't even dream of that. Mm -hmm. So as a man, why would I go to a woman who I love and respect, who's a woman, to try and get her to help coach me on how to do the things that I need to do as a man and be the things I need to be as a man and create whatever it is I need to create as a man? I'm sorry, it just doesn't make sense to me. Could, could it happen? Sure. I mean, there's a couple of really good women that I follow on the internet that I that I think are tuned in as much as is humanly possible to us as men, and we've got a lot of this stuff figured out. But again, they're they're the exception and not the rule, and I'm okay with that. I don't need women to give me that. And why should I expect them to? It's like me coming to my my wife Lucia as a, as a needy little boy and expecting her to. Fix me, make things better to give me. It's not her job. Mm -hmm. Shouldn't be her job. If I was a little boy growing up, that's mom's job. 
dad's got his job and some, a lot of dads aren't doing their job. There's a difference between mothering and fathering. Big difference. Most, <laughs> most men, because of a lot of the way our culture is, even if mom and dad are together, I see this a lot. Of, most young men and women are growing up with two mothers because I see fathers doing a lot more mothering than fathering. And it's not healthy, I don't think. And so you see a lot of fathers doing that more are mothering, mothering more than they're fathering. I did a course one time years ago where this guy said that a father's number one job with his son is to make life difficult for him. <laughs> now, when I first heard that, I kind of got my back up and I thought, you know. But when you stop and think about it and kind of. I wouldn't say let the shock go away, but when you get by the, ah, you're crazy. Well, what do we know about the world? The world out there is not necessarily an easy place. So it's getting tougher and tougher, especially for men, for young men. So if you've got a mother and a father that are cutting you slack and giving you everything and and bringing you up in this glass bubble where you don't have to do anything for anything. Everything's given to you. What's going to happen when you hit 18 or 19 or whatever and get out the door and you're on your own? You're going to think the world owes you a living. So as a father, I think I have a responsibility, particularly with my son, to make life difficult for him and not to be abusive, to do it with love, but to, to be the policeman in the house in a good way to make sure that he earns a lot of the stuff he gets, to be the law enforcement in the little stuff in the house. That, I get a big responsibility. I don't see, I see a lot of dads not doing that. They're letting their sons down. And so we got these young fellows that we see out there in society that are just doing whatever the hell they want, when they want, how they want, and they got no respect for anybody and blah, blah, blah. And not all kids are like that. There's some good kids out there. Yeah. But I see way too much of that. And when I see that, first thing that goes to my mind Where's your dad? I'd like to meet your dad. I mean, is he even around? And if he is, I'd really like to meet him. I'd like to sit down and have a conversation with him. Because I don't think he's doing his job. He's acting like a mother. If he's there at all, and the kid, the kids grow it's not their fault. I don't blame the kids. You know? They don't, they're doing what they would do. Yeah. No, what you said there really strikes a chord in me. Um, I feel like in, in some ways there was a bit of that role reversal. Like uh, my, my father was always so like maybe kind and accommodating things that I wanted to do if I went to him. But otherwise he was just kind of reserved. But I wonder if... But then my mother ended up being the, being the discipline, being the, being the policeman in the house, which made it difficult for me to receive the, 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 the nurturing, the affection, the, the loving from her because she was also being the, the policeman, so to say. And, um, and I believe that's, yeah, probably created a lot of tense, tension or confusion in my, in my psyche, in my process. Hmm. A little point, I, I think men today, and maybe forever, I don't know. I think a lot of men today spend way too much time worrying about and trying to manage the relationship with their women. And I think if they focus more on being the best man they could be for that woman, they wouldn't have to worry about it because... I believe women are brilliant at managing relationships. And I don't, think I'm, I don't think I'm very good at it. I used to think I was. But I find with Lucia that if I leave that part of our relationship up to her, and I focus on being as good as I can for her, being the best man I could, keep my word, respect her, honor her, appreciate her. And if I do all those things, you know, she's a master at looking after that relationship. Way better than I am. And I don't have to worry about it. 
I have to, but I do have, I got a lot of responsibility in there. I got to worry about how am I being as a man with her. And if I'm being that way, I believe most women will take care of the other parts and I don't need to worry about it. And I see so many men just sweating bullets around their relationship and they're just, it's driving them nuts. I don't think it's necessary. So how do you need to be? Not what do you need to do. How do you need to be? We've got something in our workshop, The Art of Masculinity, called the Code of Chivalry. And it's six ways that men need to be with women. Not just with their wife, but with their mother, their daughter, their girlfriend, their the little old lady they meet at the store, somebody they work with. It's how do we need to be as men? And if we... If men would learn those things and become masters at it and practice them, eh, not a lot else. They can get out and be productive and create shit in the world. And they don't need to come home and worry about, you know, does she love me? Is she going to... She'll naturally give you what you want and what you need most of the time. It's not going to be exclusive, but most of the time. And they don't need to worry about it. Guys spend so much. I'm mean, I mean, I talk to guys all the time. They're, they're, they're so caught up in the problems with the relationship with the women, they're not productive. They're not getting work done. You know, they're running at maybe 30% efficiency because they're not being the men they need to be with their women. And nobody's ever taught them or shown them how they need to be. So it's not surprising. You know, they saw this movie or they read this book that I should be this way and they try and be that way. And then, well, that didn't work. So let me try this one. Let me, let me find another book. Let me watch. We've gotten so far off what works that it's going to take years to ever have a chance of repairing it. I'm uh, thinking about um, my question earlier about the planning, you know, with a woman or without, and I'm feeling a little bit conflicted about that because I spent some time with a sort of mentor teacher who was hosting like a relationship kind of weekend retreat, and he was really emphasizing the importance of creating a shared vision with your woman and how this is essential to a relationship. Um, and so I'm curious what your perspective, or maybe you have an idea of maybe what's the difference between like maybe a man creating his plan for himself you know, with this feedback from other men, and maybe it's a very separate thing in kind of creating a an idea of a yeah, shared goals or, or vision with your woman in you know in the relationship. Um, in regard to what career personal family i mean i mean certainly you want to be on the same page as your partner but uh, and i i've heard similar things before i'm not i'm not crystal clear on what that looks like yeah Maybe it, it was... probably can work very well i've heard of other people have i done that no Let me just think about this for a minute. I'm going to suggest that the clearer, and I think men get this from those relationships with other men, and most men don't have that, but I think the clearer that we are as men on what our purpose is in life and who we are and where we're going and what we're doing, I, I'm going to suggest that women are attracted to that and they will support that. Mm -hmm. And they may want to tinker with it a little bit, but if, if I, the clearer I am, because I've gotten really clear in the last 20 years what my purpose is in life. And even though I've never told Lucia what it is, I live it. And she doesn't very often try and mess with who I am or what I do or where I'm going, or I wouldn't just say she's along for the ride. She's a very strong woman. She's a very intelligent woman. And, you know, she's, she gives me a lot of feedback a lot of the time. But at the end of the day, 
I'm just trying to think this through so I don't stick my foot in my mouth here. At the end of the day, I think she's pretty okay with who I am and where I'm going, I think. She tests me a lot. She questions a lot. Keeps me sharp, but I've been able to, more with the help of other men, define my plan. Where am I going? Who am I? What am I doing? Does that make sense, or am I talking? Yes, it does make am I talking sense. Swahili here? I mean, no, I, yeah, I, I, but I do hear that same thing. When you sit down with your woman and work out this plan and get the, get on the same page, with her. yeah, it, it, I, that, that could be a good thing. I, I I'd be open to that, but I, I just don't know that it's necessary. No, I think actually what you said there makes a lot of sense because I think maybe when I f yeah, go ahead. if we don't have men. And this is the problem we got. I keep coming back to this. If we don't have men in our lives that are going to help us as men figure that shit out, where else are we going to go? Well, let's sit down with my woman and figure it out and see if that works. If you've got a good woman and you've got everything's going good, it could work out very well, quite, quite well. But I think you've got a better chance if you've got good men helping you work through that. I, I think that's probably the way it was meant to work. Yeah, no, I feel like a couple more important pieces are falling into place for me. As, as I, like, I think maybe I took that, with that, that mentor's suggestion maybe a bit too far, but as you're speaking, I remembered um, some, uh, something I heard Marianne Williamson say, and she was talking about how, you know, it's also the the woman's responsibility, but to that often it's maybe a healthy dynamic for the you know the man to to make suggestions. Like often the woman wants to be taken out on a date. The man's like, well, you know, let's go to this restaurant and let's do this. But of course, you know that there there is an, an openness to to the woman going like, well, you know, actually I don't really want to go to that restaurant. Like let's do something else. So it's like when a man suggests something, like it's it's. Like I think, like what you say, it's very healthy to to have that clarity in self, and then maybe what I'm understanding this mentor was saying about the the whole shared vision thing is getting clear in yourself and then presenting that to your woman, so that she can, like you said, maybe tinker with it a little bit or have that feedback, or you know, just maybe really choose if you know the man who's presenting his his plan to her is is the man she she chooses or like she she supports that, and and maybe if she sees holes or problems with the plan where she'll test him to really see him, you know, get even more clear or more certain in his, in his plan. Well, yeah, I, there's a couple of things in there. I, one of the things I think we need to learn to do as men is to what I call cooperate without compromise. Cooperate with her efforts to manage the relationship without compromising who we are and what's important to us, what's really important to us. You know, we don't need to have a big long list of things that are important, but there's who we are, there's things that we don't want to violate who we are. So if a woman comes up with an idea, a suggestion about where to eat or what, well, do I really care? Mm -hmm. So I, I'm, I'm very prone to cooperating with what she wants if it's not compromising sort of a core value that I have or something that's really important to me. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that kind of touches in with this too I think women want us, I think most women want us to be, to lead, to be the leaders. Mm -hmm. And if they sense weakness in us or doubt or uncertainty, it'll drive them crazy. And they'll start digging in and, you know, we'd start falling apart because we've got doubt, we've got uncertainty, if we're not clear, it can, it, it, the whole relationship starts to break down. And women, can they can smell it. They can sense that. The minute you're uh, stuck in doubt, look out. Put your helmet on. Batten down the hatches because you're in for probably a nasty time. Yeah. And I guess many times women will end up leading by default, but it's not their choice, but they're just seeing the necessity of it because the men are. If we're not showing right. up, they will. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. But with men, but they'll lose all respect. And we'll probably wind up paying something. To, there'll be a price tag on that down the road that yeah. you may see the price right away, but it could be a hidden price tag that you might only figure out 
a day or a week later or an hour later or whatever. Mm -hmm. I just one little piece to that that Marion Williamson pointed out that it's, it's often women will like when a man like as you were saying you don't really care you know like yeah sure you'll you'll want to lead and suggest a place to go for dinner but you know it's not going to devastate you if she says she doesn't want to go there wants to go somewhere else except maybe for a man who's still struggling with that adolescent mother relationship he might take it as such an insult and get defensive but for a man who's or if he's being the little boy right but for a man who's kind of you know comfortable in himself and it, it's, it, I think it's also for the women to understand that, that it's, you know, it, it's okay and it's for their responsibility to, to say, oh, you know, I don't want to go there. Rather than just being like, you know, afterwards going like, well, actually, I didn't want to go there, but I just did because you suggested it. And then that, you know, creates some tension. But that's, uh, you know, it's that responsibility on both sides to be able to work things out or have that communication. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Bob, is there a song that for some reason always um, touches you? A song? God. Um, no, I mean, I love music, but I, n n there isn't one pops into my mind. No lyrics at first, or just a phrase, or even a poem, or... Mm, I, I can't think of one offhand. A movie? A movie? Uh, well, Braveheart's the first one that popped into my mind. I mean, I don't usually watch movies more than once, but that one I've watched a couple of times. I mean, I see people watch movies like 5, 10, 15 times, I think. Really? But, uh, yeah, Braveheart comes to mind more than anything. What is it about Braveheart? Well... Partly I'm Scottish ancestry, I suppose, is a big piece. But just to me, there's so many messages that come through that, you know, freedom, uh, honor. Honor is huge. I mean, in that movie, I think it's a big, big, big piece for him. Uh, the honor around who he is and his family and... Uh, I mean, it's a it's a pretty masculine movie message and uh, honor respect keeping your word no matter what you know that movie takes place in Scottish wilderness Highlands of Scotland yeah your retreats take place in wilderness too why? Uh, well, not not necessarily. We've done them in different. We've done them in auditoriums. Uh, lately, we're doing you know really retreats. We've got we're doing in camp facilities, but it's not really wilderness. I mean, uh, it's not five star by any means. But we do it in a and our and the actual event is in a in a meeting room. We don't. I mean, I've done lots of things where we're out in the bush with men. We do things we call rhinos where we go out and we're out camping and you know. Uh, a more of a wilderness type environment, but the actual workshop that we do is is not really in a in a wilderness environment. It doesn't a secure private environment where it's safe, where you know we we have our privacy and we won't be interrupted, and men feel secure to say do whatever is necessary. That's important. Even if we do that in a in a, like an auditorium or a meeting room, we need to be sure that that. Uh, that facility, that room is uh, is a safe place. A safe place, but I'm sure there are more effects. Last night we met with your group in a in a garage. Yep. It's a very masculine environment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Have you noticed an, an influence? Like if you were to meet in a very feminine environment, uh, or in IKEA, or. <laughs> I don't know that we would do that, and if we did, why would we? Well, for perhaps to play around to 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 play around with with seeing what effect the environment has. Don't you feel different in in someone else's house? Don't you feel different uh, if you're in a different country? Or? Well, certainly, but uh, if I know what works. I mean, the suggestion of doing it in a, in a feminine environment, like a ladies' lingerie store or something, I mean, just, just you know, or whatever. 
I don't know to what end we'd want to do that. It's, it's not an experiment. We're trying to give men what they need. And it's not about, to me, it's not about playing with that. I think we've pretty much determined what works, what doesn't work. I'm not sure if I answered your mm -hmm. question, but mm -hmm. uh, I, don't, I don't see the need to, uh, if I'm following the suggestion right, to, to kind of play around with the, the environmental conditions of where we do it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, you're wearing a ring, uh, I assume, assume that's your marriage uh, wedding ring. Well, let me give you the truth around it. Okay. Um, I was legally married and divorced twice. Lucia and I have been together 29 years. Uh, and about five years in, I had the diamond, I had the ring made. And I've been wearing it ever since. And we have not been what I call churched. Uh, but she's my wife. I introduce her as my wife. And in my mind, she is my wife and we're married. We have not had anybody deliver those words. Uh, and then it was some years after I started wearing this. I didn't even do what I said. I just had it made and I put it on and I've had it on ever since. I don't take it off. So I sometimes take it off when I go to bed, but I very seldom do I not have it on. And then a few years after I did this, I had a ring made for her with a nice diamond about the same size. And I got two rubies, one on either side. And she had two little boys when I met her. And I took her and her boys up for dinner one night to a nice restaurant. And I asked her to marry me. And I gave her the ring and I said, the diamond is you and the two rubies are your two boys. And I'm the band that holds us together. And she said, yes. And there's never been a date set. So, if she sets a date one day and says, this is where it, I'll be there. But maybe I'm old fashioned. I don't believe it's my job to plan that and make it happen. But I'm all in. You really do love her a lot. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think it's reciprocal based on, based on results. I think it's reciprocal. Will we get married church one day? I don't know, maybe. I'm certainly not going to say no. I asked her, she said yes, so I think we're both committed. If she's going to see this uh, interview, is she going to be surprised by anything? Mm, possibly, but I don't see I don't see any problems with it. There's There's some things that I've said that Maybe news to her, but not very much. I mean, maybe some little bits and pieces, but I'm not worried about it. She's familiar with um, how you find that men should not be vulnerable towards their women. She's so she 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 supports that. Well, that's a good. I I don't know. It's how I am. Tell you, I don't. Ex I don't. I don't feel a need to explain. I mean, we do talk a lot. We spend a lot of time together. We do a lot of stuff together. But I don't see a need to always be telling her and explaining a lot of that stuff because she knows who I am. She knows what's important to me just by how I am being, not by what I'm saying. Let me tell you a little story. I may have said this to you before. I go back to my mom and dad. They were together 60 years. They spent their last years together in an old folks home. Okay, Dad died first, then mom died a few years later. And I can remember my mother saying this, not only to me, but I've heard her say it to other people when I was, when I'd be a teenager. She would say, my Kenny never ever told me he loved me. And she would pause almost like a comedian. And she would have this little smile on her face, but she would say, he showed me every day. Now, I think, I, I think about that often, and I've said this story to many people, and I look back and I think about my mom and dad, and uh, never ever saw them fight, never saw them have an argument, harsh words. And I would bet that my dad probably never ever verbally said to her, 
I love you. He may have. I never heard him say it. Never said it to me. But every day, every breath he took, that's who he was. And that's how he was. And my mom knew that. He cared for her, he took, took care of her, he provided for her, he respected her, he honored her. He was just a rock. He was an amazing man. And he probably never, he probably never said, I'd be surprised if he did. But she absolutely knew. And she was so proud of him. So I'm a lot like my dad. We're a lot like our dads. Most men are. And... I think that a lot of how I am and who I am, Lucia knows by how I am, not by what I say. Most women don't pay a lot of attention to what we say. It's how we are. I see these guys that say, oh, I love you, I love you, I love you, and, they're, you know, they're just, and then they turn around and they, they cheat on them or they disrespect them or they fight with them. And they, You're saying one thing and doing another. I do my best not to say one thing and do another. I do my best with Lucia and with, with people to be. To be. So have I sat down and discussed with her about vulnerability? No. I don't think we've ever had that conversation. I don't think so. I don't think it's necessary. So would she be by surprised by some of the stuff that uh, that I say? I don't, I don't. I don't think so. She knows me. She knows what's important to me is working with men. I get calls. Inconvenient times. <laughs> and she knows I'll take the call. She knows I'll react. She knows I've had calls in the middle of the night. She doesn't say anything. She used to initially when I first started going. She didn't like it. She tried to get me to quit. You don't need those men. I mean, she said these things. I just keep doing what I'm doing. It's who I am. I had a call at 3 o'clock in the morning from somebody that got a problem. I get out of bed and I walk down the hall to the office. I, sit, I might sit and talk to him for a half an hour, an hour, whatever it needs to be. She doesn't bat an eye. She doesn't say a word. I don't have to explain it. It's not necessary. And yeah, we do talk. <laughs> we do things together. You know, we hike together. We spend time together. We, you know. But probably not like a lot of men and women do. I don't know, based on what I see and hear. I don't feel the need, as I used to, to explain and discuss a lot of that stuff. I can very, I, I can easily sit and spend a lot of time listening to her. And paying attention. I think that's more important. I think men need to know when and how to take the mask off. And we absolutely need a place to do that. Um, from my experiences in working with men for 25 years, I'm going to suggest that it's generally not a safe place to take your mask off with your woman. Uh, that's not popular today to say that. It, it's counterproductive today to say that. But I say it from experience of dealing with many, 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 many men over the years. Always the rule? Uh, not necessarily. There's always exceptions. Can it work? Yeah. Who are we to say what what women want? If we got a hundred women and they all say, no, we want you to take off your mask, please, we want to feel close to you. But I've never had a woman say that to me. No, I'm okay, it's just an hypothesis. If a hundred women say that, would you still say like, no, sorry, I really think it's better that we don't? What, you see, I think that sort of stuff happens because men and women don't have the men and women in their lives that they should have. And so those types of things, absolutely the place for that, and knowing when and how and where to do that is important. And I don't believe for a minute that that has been happening to any degree for 15,000 years with any degree of success. 
So why today in 2016 would that all of a sudden be a good idea? And there's times I've seen that sort of thing happen where it causes more damage to the relationship than good. Can it be good for the relationship? I'm open to that. Absolutely, I'm open to that. But I think as a general rule that we should be practicing this, I haven't seen the evidence to support that that's a good thing. In long-term committed, long-term committed relationships, could be good, but why risk it? Unless it's absolutely necessary. And I don't get that it's absolutely necessary. Well, out of curiosity? Well, hello? I, I don't, I just, sorry, I just don't get it. And I, and I get that that's not the popular opinion in today's how we're trying to get men and women to be with each other. I totally get it. Well, somewhere in a different living room, there are two women talking about uh, what men want from them. And they may say like, no, we, we know what is best for our men. They should also listen to us, shouldn't they? Why? So we should listen to the they women. They certainly know what they think is best for us. Based on... What? Based on how they feel, think, and act as a woman. They know what's best for me as a man. I mean, I'm trying to compute that. It's running around in the, the brain cells here. And by the same token, if I was sitting here as a man trying to think that I know what's best for her, I don't think so. I don't know what it's like to be a woman. I don't know what it's to be like to carry a living human being inside of me for nine months and then pushing it out. I, I don't know what it'd be like to uh, have the emotional goings on that a woman does. We're wired so differently. Our brains, I mean, they've done scientific studies. Women's brains are 10 or 100 times more active than ours. They got 20, 30, 40 different things going on in their brain at any one given time. If we can get more than two going on in our brains for the for most part, that's quite a lot. We as men, we can like actually think of nothing. Women can't do that. It drives them crazy when they say, what do you think of nothing? Well, it's probably true we're thinking of nothing or very close to it. They can't do that. We're different. So how can, we're be, given that we're that different as creatures, unless I'm, the except, and there, there are, except, I know some women that are very tuned into men and males and what they need and want and, and vice versa, but they're rare, I think, in my experience. And why would I want to go down that road? Why? It's exhausting. <laughs> I, I get no, I get no desire to to do that or go down that. I, I, get, I get to focus on who I am as a man and how I'm being and how I can be the best man possible for everybody in my life, for the men in my life, for the women in my life, for the children in my life. It's a full-time job. I enjoy doing it. I would feel isolated uh, in a relationship if if I wouldn't share with my girlfriend everything that really makes me, and that includes my insecurities. Well, if it's working for you, keep doing it. It is. Good. Uh, yeah. I don't have any... I don't have any desire to do that for the most part. And I, again, I, I don't want you to think that, you know, we spend time in this house and don't communicate, because we do <laughs> a lot. But I don't have any need or desire to uh, to go down that path. It's not there. I've been there in the past. So I I do I do remember what that feels like. Mm -hmm. Didn't work very well. Long term, didn't work very well. 
it can be very productive short term. A lot of the information that we're that I see that we're seeing out there around re, what I call relationship sites tend to be more dating sites. How to find a woman, how to hook up, how to get laid, how to have that feeling that we're all looking for. That sort of stuff can work extremely well in that environment. It can be very productive in that environment. I've proven that in the past. Absolutely. But I really, I, re, I personally don't think it's necessary in a long-term, successful, committed relationship. There's so many other, there's so many other things that we need to focus on, or for me as a man anyway, that I need to focus on being a man, being there for her, being open to listening to her and being open to what she's got going on and um, just appreciating her, respecting her and uh, appreciating her efforts to make me a better man. All I, I mean, there's a whole raft of stuff that I need to, continually be on top of and the rewards are pretty damn good okay is there a part that uh, we haven't uh, talked about in the interview that you'd like to bring up I don't know we covered a lot of stuff I can't um... nothing pops into my mind What makes a good host? A good host? You're talking about like in a men's group environment? Yeah. Well, years ago when I was involved in what we called point programs, that was where we'd take men back from a weekend and we'd have a program, an eight-week program, where we would help bring that team together and create a team that at the end of that would be self-sufficient and have a leader in the, in the team. The, the number one quality that we looked for in that group of men was the man that cared the most about the health and welfare of the men. So I think that maybe kind of answers the question. It's, and that, you know, most men care, but if you're in a group of men and you've been with that group of men for a while and you've been in conversation and doing stuff together, you, you know who's got the biggest heart, who cares most about them, not... Hmm. Is that a feminine quality? I don't think so. Let me think about that, is that a feminine quality? Yeah, I'm going to say no. And what just happened for me as I've been going through that, I, I deal with a lot of men that are from, that their families have been split up. I mean, they're fathers and they've gone through divorce. And contrary, I think, to a lot of what we see in, in the world and what we're fed, I believe that most, many of the men care more about those children and care more about that family and have often done more to try and keep that together than the women have. And that's a generalization. But rips a lot of men apart to have that happen and to not be able to see their kids that they yeah it, it's ugly it's awful sometimes and it appears to me that in some cases it, it's not quite so much on the other side and I I don't want to sound negative to women because I, I love women believe me but I, it, it, that's not a, I don't think that's a feminine quality for men to be caring and concerned about other men, about kids, about family. But no, it's, I don't think it's a feminine quality at all. Robert Bly calls a mentor a male mother. Mm. I hadn't thought of it in that term. I, yeah. Bly's got a lot of good stuff. 
Uh, I hadn't heard that. But. Besides Bly, who are your, who gives you most inspiration? I don't know if, if Bly at all is one of them. My father. A lot of stuff he, and it's how he was. Not so much what he told me. It's who he was and how he was. I guess. What my mother saw, I guess. You know, um, I mean, there's been other men that have had a lot of influence. Uh, Justin Sterling, who you've heard of. I mean, he's, uh, I think he's misunderstood a lot, but brilliant stuff he gives us in the right context. Absolutely. Um, I mean, there's other men I look up to and, and respect that people don't know. Rick Russell was a man that uh, you've probably never heard of, most men haven't, that had a huge impact on my life as far as being being a man, being a good man, being the man the world needs, as we say. You know, Matt Lyons, Peter Thompson, they're the two facilitators we have that deliver our, our weekend. Um, I, I get... I mean, I, I'd say I got hundreds of men. There's so many. Um, there's not a huge number of public figures out there that really turn my crank. I don't think we have very many good male, there's some, but we don't have very many good male role models out there today, unfortunately. What inspiration do you get from your grandchild? Well, I got three, actually. Uh, I mean, my granddaughters are amazing. Um, and I got a little grandson, step-grandson. I mean, he's my grandson. I mean, I raised his dad from the time he was two. So, And, I mean, he's amazing. He's only a year old, but just to watch him develop has, has been great. Uh, my two granddaughters are quite different. Um, the youngest one I'm kind of amazed with because she's uh, she's so driven she's 13 and she's her goal is to uh, it's more than a goal she's determined to get a scholarship to Harvard I mean she's only 13 I didn't even know what the hell Harvard was when I was 13 a scholarship to Harvard and a gold medal in the Olympics and for her age she's the best goalie hockey goalie in BC for her age I that's grandpa talking, but it's true. I mean, you look at the stats, look at her record. She's way out there. Without breaking confidentiality, are there men that you have worked with or that are currently in your group that you can say, like, from you, I relearned really how to do this? Um. How to be comfortable with anger, how to... Uh, uh, strive without um, without going overboard. Um. Um, How to be patient. You know, I, I'm t I'm just thinking in my brain to see if there's particular individuals, and I mean, there's been moments, but to me, it's been. It's been a collage of all the men uh, that I've done stuff with over the years. Uh, and there there's some amazing men in that list, but I, I, I can't think of an incident hmm. offhand that really stands out. I remember one men's group uh, in New West. I'm not sure if you were there, one meeting, and... The subject came up of the value of being silly. Mm. Strange lessons come out of nowhere sometimes mm. in a man's group. To be comfortable with, you know, letting go, just kind of let go of the social anxiety, maybe. Loosen up.
mm -hmm. to loosen up. Yeah, there's huge value there. That's that's an area that I probably struggle with personally more than a lot of the others, but it, there's huge value there. I recognize that. You personally struggle with being silly? Well, we I call it being three-dimensional. Three-dimensional man. And those three dimensions are Clint, Curley, and Gandhi. Curley from the Three Stooges. Gandhi, well, we all know who Gandhi is. And Clint, Clint Eastwood. So there's the macho Mr. Clint Eastwood, John Wayne, okay? There's Gandhi, the spiritual man. Yeah, we all know Gandhi. And then there's Curly, the goofy, crazy, don't give a shit, but you don't care what anybody thinks. So to be a three-dimensional man, to have equal, and nobody, I don't, I shouldn't say nobody, very few people are equal in those. Usually most men lean more to, towards one than the other. But if we can be a balance of those three, the more, the more we can strive to be a balance of those three, I think the better men we are. Three-dimensional man, Clint Curley Gandhi. And why is it so hard to be goofy? I don't know. I mean, it's probably, I, I don't know. I, it probably relates to how I was brought up as a child, which I, I mean, I could probably go and try and psychoanalyze and try and figure it out. I don't know if it's going to serve me. It, it's the, of the three, it's the one that I am the least comfortable with. Can I do it? Sure, I've done it. I mean, I, I can do it, but it's not, I'm, I can be pretty comfortable with the other two. Most of the time. And I think if you took any man, you're going to find similar. Usually there's one that's much stronger than the other two. And there's generally one that's relatively weak. I don't think you'll, if you think of the men you know, you won't likely say, well, that guy's got all three equal. He's a third, a third, a third. Probably not going to happen very often. But if we can, if we can strive to be all three... It's pretty well-rounded. Well, I'd like to support you on that. In fact, I think I'm going to challenge you to learn how to be a stand-up comedian. Sure, no problem. Yeah. There are those those comedy clubs that mm -hmm. where groups come together and learn how to be funny. How about yourself? Now, are you? Do you feel you got all three kind of running, all balanced out? No, humor is an issue for me too. Mm -hmm. There's all kinds of riddles about humor that I don't get. Mm -hmm. I think most men struggle with at least one. And I know some men that struggle with probably two out of the three that are way off on one side or the other. But mm -hmm. They're all good men. Mm -hmm. And I'm like every one of them. Thanks so much for being willing uh, to talk to us. Yeah, it was fun. It's been a, you know, it took me a while to... It's been a journey. It's a continuing journey. Sorry, go ahead. It took me a while to, to uh, appreciate you. In the beginning, it didn't. I had to warm up or something. I, I sensed that things you were uncomfortable about, but yeah. things I said or how I was or whatever, that, that's okay. I, I'm, gl I'm glad I didn't give up. I'm glad I, I remained open and, you know. I feel you. You. I I meet. I meet men often that I would, you know, years ago I'd have blown off. You know. Hmm. You know, thirty years ago I probably wouldn't give me the time of day. Hmm. That's thirty years ago. Hmm. But we're all the same. We're all searching for answers. And <laughs> I think we all like to think we're right in what we believe and what we feel. I'm probably more open now to looking at other opinions and possibilities than I ever have been. But at the end of the day, I got to do what I think is right for me. And I've, I, I constantly... I constantly question myself about a lot of stuff. Am I right? And 
you know, I change a little bit here and there, and I, I got a lot of great men in my life that will hold the mirror up and ask me difficult questions sometimes that I don't want to really look at. And I do my best to really look inside and be honest about it. I mean, we've all walked different paths. We've had different families, we've had different backgrounds, we've been treated differently, we've had different relationships. And we're a product of that. So what have I learned from my journey? And what can I continue to learn? So that maybe I can help somebody else down the road. It's interesting. It is. Uh... Perhaps uh, we'll have another interview in uh, 10 years. Yeah. I plan on being around. <laughs> <laughs>